Good afternoon, can everybody see me? Because as you know, I'm tall. Um, welcome everybody. Um, we got an interesting panel lined up this afternoon. And if you look at your uh, brochure, the title is The Role of Voice in Enhancing Patient Care, Real World Cases. And we heard quite a few of them this morning, thanks to the, the panel members. Um, I also want to thank my newfound friend Bradley and Ray over here for inviting us to join. So thank you very much. And I also want to thank uh, the many colleagues that are here that, that I've worked on with many other projects. So welcome everybody. My name is Harry Pappas and I'm the founder and CEO of the Intelligent Health Association. And uh, a couple more questions. How many of you have heard of the HIMSS show? H-I-M-S-S? Okay, at the Him Show for the last nine years, we've been building the Intelligent Health Pavilion. I don't know how many of you have visited the pavilion, uh, but the pavilion is about 25 or so thousand square feet, and it's an educational destination pavilion um, because our goal is, is not to sell our vendors, our sponsors concrete, but to really produce educational programs um, the technology w w we're hearing about today is great, and I get to work with uh, 21 other technologies, and the technologies are great for improving patient care, patient safety, and the patient experience and driving down costs, but how do we go about educating the healthcare community, and how do we go about educating the consumers to utilize this technology? The key, my friends, is education and ongoing education, and this is why myself and my colleagues formed the Intelligent Health Association uh, 10 years ago, um, not to have um, a conference as big as HIMSS and not to have membership uh, like many associations do, but myself and my colleagues are self-made entrepreneurs, and our goal is to do social good by educating the healthcare community to adopt new technologies. And the key to adopting new technologies, as we all know, is ongoing vendor neutral education. So when you come to our pavilion at HIMSS, it's all about education. Even the sponsors have to go through a peer review process. We just, we're not there to sell concrete, we're, we're sell to sell education and to help educate. So I invite you to come by HIMSS in February uh, in Orlando, Florida. Um, but I'd like to start by um, just going over what we're going to do is that I'm going to ask each of the uh, panel members to uh, introduce themselves and have some um, descriptions of, of their organization, um, use cases, applications, and then I'm going to follow up with um, questions to each of the panelists. Um, the questions, I've broken, the, broken them down into two areas. Uh, the first area is the effect, the impact of this technology on the consumer and aging in place and chronic care and so forth. And the second part of the questions will be around the, what I call the B2B. How do we get um, the hospital administrators, the providers, the insurance companies, uh, the, the nurses to adopt these technologies and to use them. Um, I can tell you that for the last two years at our pavilion at HIMSS, we actually demonstrated in the OR and the ED, and, and David, I don't know what other room you were in, one of the other rooms, uh, the home, you were in the smart home. Um, so we actually put these technologies in context. So when the decision makers from uh, uh, Mass General or Hopkins come through, they can see a, a, a holistic scenario of how all these technologies fit into an operating room or fit into a trauma ED. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to start out with uh, Nate. And Nate, thank you for a great presentation this morning. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so I'm not gonna take a, a full five minutes because you already heard from me this morning. But um, I'm Nate Trelor, one of the co-founders of a company called Orbita, based out of Boston here, right over in the seaport. And where we kind of fit in the ecosystem of voice is we're an enabling technology platform. 
So our, our flagship product is something called Orbit of Voice, and the best way to think about it is if you know anything about the web, you've heard of technologies like WordPress. These are technologies that are designed to make it easier to build, manage, and uh, optimize websites. We do that for voice and for chatbots and other conversational endpoints. And it's optimized for healthcare, which means what we've done is we've built into it sort of the patterns and templates, and, and increasingly more recently, the content that informs the uh, healthcare-specific use cases are what we're seeing as, as those more, more common ones. Um, to kind of give a perspective on where we are and where the industry is from our point of view with voice is um, it sort of emerged primarily, as you all well know, in the consumer sector. So B2C is uh, it's referred to um, organizations trying to reach consumers through the devices like the Amazon Echo and Google Home devices. And increasingly on smartphones as people start to use voice um, to communicate uh, with uh, applications on their phone. What was it, the pizza phone? Is that the example? I really like yeah. that. Um, Good example. Yeah. So um, where we, where we kind of cut our teeth at Orbit was supporting applications that are really geared towards that, that scenario, Con like building skills for the Alexa skill store, voice applications that are on consumer apps. Uh, what's happening is we're kind of shifting into use cases that are more B2B, in other words, uh, serving the needs of an organization like a provider or a payer or a pharmaceutical firm who are trying to um, solve a problem that they have using voice and voice-powered applications to streamline engagement with patients, to improve data collection, to um, ensure adherence to treatment and, or medication, a, a whole variety of use cases. Um, and then another kind of third area is right, right in the clinical setting. We talked about this this morning where it's really about transcribing or capturing um, information in the inter during the interaction uh, between a patient and their clinician or just a clinician's notes. Um, all of these are sort of use cases that represent sort of degree of evolution and we're kind of moving towards these much more sophisticated, personalized PHI, personal health information oriented applications. So I'm um, happy to be here and happy to be on this panel. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Michael Cullen, I'm the co-founder of a company called Novalte. Um, so I, I'm down from Toronto, but uh, you probably hear I don't have a Canadian accent, I'm Irish. So uh, I immigrated to Canada about uh, a decade ago, and uh, when I was in Ireland I was a controls engineer. And as a controls engineer, do I could want to have redundant systems that were remotely uh, connected to something, a terminal, so a technician could be able to look at it. So 10 years ago, I started working in the field of accessibility, helping individuals with physical uh, disabilities to live independently, either giving them a voice or being able to control their own lights and that kind of stuff. But there was always a problem where that these individuals would get these systems that would, were generally back then were all hacked together, um, and they would break. And all you'd have to do majority of the time was unplug something or there was this broken cable. But well, because they weren't connected and the Internet of Things wasn't really there at that point, we'd have to send somebody out. So when we had the advent of the IoT revolution and where IoT became more of a commercialized product, I seen where like, we could actually have a system where we could actually enable these individuals uh, to be able to control their own home. And uh, back then, it was all apps. You, there was an app for that. Uh, but an awful lot of my clients, they physically couldn't interact with their phone. So that was a, a massive barrier. And then there was technology that was created for them to be able to access the phone and access an app. And there was an app for this and there was an app for that. And they would have to scan through one function to get to one thing and then get out of that app and then to another app. So when Google Voice and Alexa came out, it was a monumental change for our clients. The majority of them could use their voice and they could say, turn on my lights, and the lights would turn on. So for our clients, like, I, I can't say how profound this is. It's like we have clients who are literally crying that they can turn on their own lights. Um, like for our industry, like, uh, the, the whole ability to use voice is very comparable to the power wheelchair where now these individuals who couldn't control their own home can. That's my spiel. Very moving. So my name is David Box. I'm with Macadamian Technologies. Um, I guess you could look at us as a, a UX design research and an engineering firm. Uh, 
specifically in healthcare, and, and we help our clients ultimately solve some of their biggest healthcare challenges uh, through technology. We're uh, instrumental in um, developing interoperability solutions, uh, IoT, the whole connected health space, as well as voice. We started very early on in the voice game. Um, we recognized the potential for voice about three years ago. Doesn't sound like much, but those of you that have been around for a while know that was early days. Um, we, we like to say we were launching our first skill in the Amazon store when there was only 12, 12 skills in the store. So we've gone on um, to work with uh, partners and with our own uh, innovation lab to develop uh, use cases and solutions um, in, in multiple different uh, verticals in, in the healthcare space, in everything from elder care to, um, to chronic disease management to, um, to simple tools to help people uh, navigate their, their, um, their illnesses, if you will. One of those tools that we created uh, most recently and have partnered with the, uh, the um, Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario with is a, a product called My Diabetes Coach that's in the end stages of its development and will be, um, will be tested uh, clinically with the uh, Children's Hospital. And it's a tool that really combines the caregiver, the parent or the guardian, together with the clinician and the patient all in one. It's a platform that's designed to enable the patient to report in on their progress with their weight, with their blood glucose, and uh, have that tie into their clinician, but also be able to receive um, affirmation and, and support from Alexa, while at the same time um, being told when they've, when they've misstepped a little bit. So the idea here is that the, the uh, Adolescents with type 2 will report in either via Bluetooth or, or verbally to the system. They'll be able to, um, to get that affirmation that they're on track or that they've veered off course. And Alexa, over time, uh, gains some intelligence with this product where uh, she'll make certain, uh, certain decisions or, or deduct certain things based on the inputs that she's getting and will be able to um, advise not only the patient on how to correct it, but also the clinician. We've then also integrated with HealthWise, uh, the HealthWise library, so that the patient can now get information um, based on symptoms that they're experiencing. So, Alexa, I'm not feeling well today. What can I eat? And, and they'll get a, um, a host of different uh, types of foods that they can consume, taking their condition into consideration. One other use case that I wanted to highlight today for you is one that we've um, also recently completed with Health Navigator, and I believe Jeffrey Schwartz is uh, here if he's still in, there he is. Um, this is a triage tool that is used for people to make, in short, make go or no-go decisions on whether they should go to the ER. So this is a tool where you can tell Alexa what you're experiencing. I'm having pain um, you know, when I'm urinating, and Alexa will ask you a series of questions and then based on the answers that you're giving, ultimately give you uh, the direction of whether uh, you should visit the ER with this or you should um, wait and see your general practitioner. Many other use cases we could get into. Uh, there's certain uh, aspects of some of the work that we've done together with Orbita to um, come up with creative ways to make Alexa HIPAA compliant and we were able to do that successfully with Amgen in a recent launch for a, uh, a, a, clinical, um, uh, a clinical study. Uh, so there are ways, despite all, of the, um, despite all of the thoughts to the contrary, there are ways to make HIPAA, uh, compliant, uh, HIPAA compliant. It's not elegant, it's a little bit clunky, but it certainly uh, is doable and I'm sure we'll touch on a little more of that as we, uh, as we progress today. Thanks, Dave. Hi. My name is Joshua Lang. Um, I'm a resident physician here at Brigham Women's Hospital, a clinical fellow at Harvard Medical School, and uh, a writer uh, for New York Times and New Yorker. And uh, I serve as an advisor to Robin Healthcare, which is a company that's working to do essentially Alexa in the doctor's office. I thought I'd start out by telling you a little bit, uh, very briefly, about my day. 
Uh, often I start out in the hospital wards with a team of three or four doctors to see uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 patients. We stand outside the room with the patient, we discuss a plan, and then we go into the room. And I can tell you the minute that we walk into the room, as the leader of the team, I'm looking at the clock, uh, wondering how much time we're gonna take in there because every minute that I spend in the doctor's office, er, sorry, with the patient, is taking away from time that I have for the rest of the day to do the clinical documentation that's required of me. Every minute I spend with patients, talking to them and not entering things into the computer is a minute that I need to spend afterwards, either after the all my encounters end or at night in what's called pajama time, uh, sitting in front of my computer, entering things in, into the, my computer, into the EMR, clinical documentation, billing, what have you. And so there are a number of ways to solve this um, from a doctor's perspective. Uh, you can be a sucker like me and enter everything in by hand, literally typing everything out that happened between uh, me and my patient and my thoughts and my plan going forward and whatever billing is required, and I can do that myself, that's what I do. Uh, some people use dictaphones and voice recognition software to dictate. Um, that uh, still requires some time afterwards and is prone to, some studies say, up to like 20% error rate. And then there's a uh, kind of booming industry now of scribes. 5% of the industry is now, 5% uh, of doctors across the United States hire someone to walk with them around to every single appointment and write down the clinical encounter. Um, and uh, these people are often pre-medical students, uh, graduated college, pre-medical school. They have about a year. You spend three months tra training them, then you lose them after nine months. And I think we can all agree that the solution for the healthcare industry across the United States is not hiring 800,000 scribes. So what are, what are the challenges and where are we at now and what's exciting about this? I think uh, getting into the doctor's office with voice recognition is very exciting. What we're very good at right now is uh, intent or command-based stuff. Alexa, do this. Robin, do this. Siri, do this. Text this person. And that's certainly helpful. And you can take off a lot of time off doctors' hands by doing that kind of stuff. Um, but what's most exciting, I think most interesting, and what I advise Robin on as a writer and a physician who's in this every day, is how do we extract meaning from these conversations? How do we get to a clinical summary? instead of just turning on the voice recognition and spitting out every single word that was spoken during an encounter and actually get to a meaningful note and a meaningful summary. Um, and I, I think that's uh, really exciting. And to me, that's actually, for, from a doctor's perspective, uh, and my interaction with technology on a daily basis, that's the holy grail. You know, how do I take away my time typing out my thoughts and my summary in front of the computer and how do I delegate that to a piece of technology that I don't have to think about so that my time in the room with my patients is entirely spent looking at my patient and talking to them? Thank you very much. Thank you, panel. That was the... Hello? Wow. <laughs> Thank you, panel. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said earlier, um, we're going to start with a series of questions that uh, will enable us to look at uh, the consumer pacing, facing side of, of voice. What does this mean to the patient, to the consumer? So with that, question number one for each of you to answer is um, no doubt voice technology will have impact on the health and wellness of the patient slash consumer. Can each of you share with us some examples of how you can see these technologies affecting the population? Since I have the, okay. since I have the yeah, microphone, yeah, I'll start out. I think it's very clear. You know, who is your customer in this case? I think first it's actually the physicians are the uh, customer, and it changes the lives of physicians. If Correct. you can, if you can uh, accurately do this stuff and uh, get into the doctor's office and remove time from my day, uh, documenting into a computer as, a, as my own scribe. That's not what I was trained to do. And I think for patients, it makes a huge difference. If you have a doctor who's looking at you and connecting with you, 
and uh, spending time explaining things instead of worrying about how much time after the encounter. And uh, in a, as an allusion to what you're going to talk about in the future, the more complex my patient is, the more time I have to spend documenting. And so it's my simple patient that's 18 years old coming in for a routine check that I can sit, lounge back and have a conversation. But the patient who really needs it is the one I'm most stressed out about. So I think if you look at the consumer, um, you, you could uh, potentially be taking uncertainty out of the equation. You can help them find answers quickly. Um, if you look at it overall on the, on the healthcare system here in the US, you could lessen the burden on the healthcare system as well with these voice type technologies. Especially when you're looking into elder care, we've got 10,000 people a day turning 65 in this country. Um, the numbers by many of the uh, larger providers will tell you that we just don't have enough beds to accommodate this. So this is long over short going to become more of a need than uh, a luxury to have. Um, my comment is very much uh, similar to David's there. Um, we, we've already found that uh, by uh, using voice for our customers that uh, we can reduce uh, caregiver time. Um, we're in the currently uh, we're currently doing a pilot study to show how using these enabling the, our clients to be able to control their own homes can uh, reduce caregiver time by 45 minutes a day for heavy care clients and that has uh, a savings for the actual organizations that are supporting these clients but also increases the quality of life for these individuals because they'd no longer have to make a phone call and say hey attendant can you come up and turn on my light or change my TV channel so I can have their own independence. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo the consumer use cases. Um, I get shared sort of the, the anecdote of uh, Arthur this morning, um, a similar anecdote with a uh, polychronic patient with uh, essentially a quadriplegic, and it's similar to what Michael described, where um, this technology is transformative for these type of patients. It can truly transform their lives. Little things like being able to turn the lights on with the power of their voice or uh, control other aspects of their home is, is, is a transformative experience. So I would highlight that. And then, you know, what, what uh, Josh has also described in, in, the, uh, in the clinical setting, there are very powerful use cases for um, improving clinical efficiency in the very precise way that he's describing, but it also corresponds to um, the efficiencies that can be gotten by having patients more um, adherent to their treatment when they're not in the hospital or more able to access care uh, between episodes of care. So I think uh, the value proposition is highly dependent on the use case and they're profound in a lot of different areas. I'm hanging on the microphone. Who's Mike? Thank you for that insight. Um, Follow-up question. <clears throat> uh, voice, how will it enable the consumer, the discharge patient, to live a better, more comfortable, longer, safer living lifestyle as we all age in place? I think I'll, I'll pass this over. Um, yeah. worries. So I, I think I, I touched on it before when I said it, it's going to act as a, a tool to really help people get information quickly and help people make decisions in the home where they otherwise would have had to go and seek out the uh, advice of a, of a physician or a medical professional. And uh, added to that, many times they end up in the ER this way. So with uh, using tools like what we're currently uh, developing or co-developing uh, would be a real benefit to people in that they can they can get this advice in the home and understand whether what their ailment is 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 something that can wait or if it's something that needs immediate attention um, for uh, a lot of our clients um, they uh, they can't physically interact with their uh, the tools like smart devices um, so, like, having the, the Google Voice and Alexa, like, it's amazingly powerful, 
Um, and what we've done is we, we've wrapped a solution around to make sure that all these individual smart devices all work together. Um, what we're seeing straight off the bat is uh, the immediate, uh, the caregivers who are the family members, um, they, they're amazed about how much time that they're saving not going over to their loved ones for simple things like, oh, my internet stopped working. You need to plug it in because we're going to be calling the family tomorrow via Skype or something like that. And the power of having voice to be able to connect the, these loved ones via like making a phone call or doing the, the, the other pieces, is, it's amazing. Like these, these are life-changing pieces of technology. You know, because we're a platform provider, one of the things we look for are what are the common patterns of applications that exist. And there's a few that have come forward in the consumer space. So I talked about them in, um, in more precise terms earlier, but um, access to information, the question, ask a question, get an answer back. That's, that's one that's um, prevalent in uh, home care scenarios. So an example is a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis, they have questions about the condition, maybe they're either recently diagnosed or they're just trying to get educated on their condition. They wanna know if they can drink a beer, right? And if you have access to a, a, an assistant that can answer that question um, you know, quickly, it's helpful. Another one is uh, care coordination and scheduling. Um, I need a ride to the doctor tomorrow. Uh, you know, how can I get that taken care of? There's uh, um, firms that have developed voice applications that connect with Uber. Right? I need a ride to the doctor, and you know, not, not just a ride to the doctor, I need a ride to the doctor in a wheelchair accessible van, um, and things like that. Uh, another one is um, a, a coach that will walk you through a procedure or a process, and it's a very abstract idea, but you can apply it to any of the examples that, one, one of the examples I shared where it's, okay, you gotta do this therapy, you gotta do it in a very prescribed way, I'm gonna walk you through it. Anyway, th that's just three. And then also care coordination. Um, I need to send a message. I need to call somebody. Uh, or I want to collect a message. So what we're seeing is in the consumer space is there are these sort of common patterns that are emerging. And they're different. The content is different. But the interactions are very similar. So, you know, our, in our business, we're, we care about that because we're a platform. We want to templatize these so they're easy to deploy. Let's see if that one works. One more quick comment to that. What we're also seeing from the, from the clinician's perspective or the patient's interaction perspective with the clinician is more FaceTime using these types of technologies. If you can build a platform in such a way that the clinician stays informed, now you go from, in the case of, of type 2 diabetes, for example, the clinician has significantly less than 1% FaceTime throughout the patient's entire life that, they're, that they're, they're, they really need the advice of the clinician for their, their, um, their illness. These types of technologies interfacing with the clinicians gives the clinician insight into the patient's day to day that helps them better, help them better manage the disease. Uh, final question for this segment. Um, what impact will voice have on the delivery of telehealth telemedicine services? Is it complementary? Is it competitive? I, for, from the perspective of uh, Alexa or, and uh, in the doctor's office and Robin, um, I think it's complementary, pretty obviously. Um, if you have technology in the doctor's office that's already used to interact with patients and on a daily basis, uh, then I think that goes together very seamlessly with uh, with telehealth. I think it's almost forced to be complementary today um, with the way some of our regulations are, are written here in the US. Um, there is no billing code for a voice only type of a product. So in the event that we're looking at it from a perspective of how do we make money with this, it, it needs to be complementary. I, I agree with that statement. Um, like having the, the, the ability to uh, enable these clients to use their voice from like their home and the home is anywhere and uh, connecting then into like the remote monitoring piece is, yeah, the two things are one. I couldn't disagree more with my fellow panelists actually. No, I'm, I'm only kidding. I'm just <laughs> checking to see if you guys are awake. Um, 
No, I think it's for, for sure complementary. And the example I showed on uh, the slides for those of you in this morning session, we've, we've got example implementations where it starts out with an automated voice assistant and it can relax to a tele, telemedicine interface, um, uh, sort of that agent example. So I think they're very complementary what uh, the new technologies uh, represented by Alexa and Google Assistant and others are is just a, another channel, another way for creating that connection and opening up that that uh, conversation. How much more time do we have, Brad? I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Let me um, move on to the second uh, part. Um, what is the effect of voice technology on the health providers, clinical medical professionals? And I think you've been addressing that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the question is, what's the effect on uh, medical professionals? Yeah, um, for me, it would be a game changer. Uh, obviously, if I could, um, uh, and I think what, what Robin has seen already is that uh, any time that you can shave off of my workday not interacting with patients is extremely valuable. And I think the case in point is like the growing scribe industry, which is now 5% of the market for documentation and is like a $4 billion industry of people just hiring individuals to sit in there in the office and take notes. And as voice can uh, replace that, I think it's a huge opportunity and uh, would change my day to day dramatically. Yeah, I'll go and then I have a mic. Um, just quickly, uh, I think one area we haven't really delved into is uh, visibility into patient wellness between visits. Um, and it's not so much a, a voice proposition as it is sort of a, a mobile health or M health, um, digital health proposition is that um, the more the patient is sharing information about their wellness between visits, the more information that can ultimately be available to the clinician when they finally do come in. So the, 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 the clinician knows more about the patient and how they're progressing on their treatment or how their overall health is. So just visibility into patient wellness between visits is improved. So look, physician burnout is real. We know it's, we know it's an issue and anything we can do to reduce the, the paperwork burden on the physician side, as Josh was explaining, was greatly appreciated. We were talking earlier um, before the panel started about um, having artificial intelligence and tools like Alexa create um, uh, enough awareness around a situation to be able to produce a, a, a care path assistance or some kind of clinical decision support for the, for the physician, which um, is, uh, I guess, a great uh, tool to serve as a reminder in the event that uh, a physician would forget about a, um, a, a test that needs to be performed, for example, or overlook something uh, in, the, in the process. We also look at it from a perspective when we're talking about elder care, um, especially um, in facilities, we look at it from as a cost savings tool as well. Um, the ability to record what's happening on, on an ongoing basis as it's happening enables the care providers to capture more. Um, simple things like catheters and, 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 and diapers, for example, are huge areas of loss in elder care because when the care provider needs to uh, wait until the end of the day or, or halfway through their shift to record these things, those are the types of items that often get overlooked. It's quick to pull something out of a closet somewhere and it doesn't get billed for. Um, uh, one of the things that we're seeing is with the, the advancements in healthcare, uh, individuals uh, are living longer or more complex uh, illnesses. And e even like the individuals with physical disabilities and uh, having a, a platform like uh, the voice services um, is more of a, a platform where anybody can use. There isn't this learning curve as it was for the graphical user interfaces and the apps like we, as we, as we said earlier, to like we naturally talk. Um, we're seeing that uh, there is a massive adoption across the spectrum for individuals with di uh, physical disabilities, cognitive disabilities, the elderly. They're able to pick this stuff up a lot quicker. And what happens then is you don't need somebody to pay someone to go off and do mundane stuff like turning on and off lights and do, like, doing, doing stuff that you, they can control themselves. And uh, we're also noticing that um, if the, the family members aren't paying somebody to do it, they have to do it themselves. So 
the, the ease of use is, a, is so much better. Thank you, panel members. We're going to turn it over to our audience for questions. Wow, very knowledgeable group. No questions. <laughs> well, any uh, we remarks? I always oh. stand up. Hi. I always stand up, so, you know, abhor a vacuum. Um, but actually, but as you were talking, I, I more had some observations I wanted to share and actually get more input on. And it has to do with the issue of incentivizing the use of this, either getting it reimbursed or incentivizing it in one way or the other. And it occurred to me that there are a couple of touch points, if not many, many more. And I guess I'm interested in, in whether you see these as, as useful paths to go down. Um, you know, one side is through the much maligned and rightfully maligned um, meaningful use program where their doctors are supposed to spit out a clinical summary at the end and they use this standardized continuity of care document which is absolutely ridiculous and doesn't say anything and records all the wrong stuff and it goes to their patient portal and nobody finds it. And obviously this is a, a good, uh, I've talked to more people here who are talking about that end of visit summary form than anything else and, and that is a sweet spot. It's a real use to the patient. They would really like to have that. So if there's some way you could um, weasel yourself into um, you know, the meaningful use um, stuff and certified electronic health record technology, why, you know, that might be a way to get incentivized. And the other is that with um, payment reform and alternative payment, you know, uh, models that they're coming out with, um, they are trying to get people out of hospitals, they're trying to get them um, sequentially down into lower levels of service and back into the home, and they're looking at social determinants of health and things like that, and this kind of technology is that nice bridge between giving that support at home for all the reasons that you've just discussed and plugging people into the community for the types of resources for nutrition or transportation that they need. So if you could start proving your model um, in, as you want to, this is, you've heard me say it before, get yourselves into the literature, do these pilots, really rigorous pilots. CMS would love to find ways to um, really support, you know, people staying at home and, and this is one good tool for it. So I don't know, it's probably take a 10 year trip, but you know, it might be worth it. Well, it wasn't a question, but I'll make a comment on that. Um, um, I, I, can't, I mean, certainly there are value-based reimbursement models and other ways so that are motivating better care at home. Um, the incentive also is on the end, end user side too. How do you incent somebody to engage with a voice experience? And I'll just make one quick point, which is that devices like the Amazon Echo and Google Assistant, they're not medical devices. They're lifestyle devices. So if you have an, an application like a device, you place phone calls, you can play games, and you can track your wellness. And that creates a, a more, it, it removes the barriers to adoption because it's not something that they're wearing around their neck or it's attached to their wrist. So it's not so much incentive, but it does speak to um, the likelihood that somebody would be inclined to use one of those devices versus some other medically oriented alternative. Brief comment. I, I love your reference to meaningful use. This is a uh, a constant nag on uh, doctor's shoulders. I have a lot of stories, many of you probably know, doctors who retired because of meaningful use, um, literally stopped practicing just because of the need to enter things into the computer and they can't catch up with Epic. My father was actually one of them. Um, and so this is uh, obviously very important. Um, and I think Bob Walker talks in his book about you know jobs that advertise, you, here you won't have to use an EMR. Um, and uh, you can imagine jobs that start advertising, instead of using an EMR, we have voice recognition that will do that job for you. Mm. Um, so that's just one comment. I think also just to piggyback a little bit on what Nate was saying, um, conversational UX design is a huge part of this. You don't have the visual cues like you have with an app. You look at your phone, you get reminded that an app exists. So having a, a, a proper conversational UX design created that's based on research and based on what your users are going to want is going to help you succeed. Uh, one thing that we're seeing is the, um, like out in the community, um, our clients naturally, they actually started asking, when, when, when are you gonna have Google and Alexa integrated into your systems? 
and uh, we did it. And what one of the things that they saw, like the client saw, was now it was easier for them to interact with their environment. And so th they were already incentivized to do this kind of stuff. To talk about incentives, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we're currently working with several major insurance companies who are looking at how do they incentivize the policyholder? Um, how do they incentivize them to install smart technologies in the home? Did I take my medication? Did I do my cardio exercises? And a lot of this data is very important data um, to the pharmaceutical industry, um, the uh, uh, local hospital to prevent readmissions. So the insurance industry <clears throat> visits our pavilion annually to get a better idea how to use the technology to improve their services and their coverage um, to their policyholders. So this is something that they're looking at very closely. How do I incentivize you to maybe have a free echo in your home, okay? Uh, what's, what's the business model there? Or how does your employer, and everyone is very interested in what's going on with uh, um, Berkheimer, uh, Hathaway um, and, and Amazon, um, how will they then use the technology in the home and how will they incentivize their employees to really use the technology? Okay, any other comments? Yes. Yes, hi, uh, thank you for an excellent panel. Um, I had mentioned before, my name is Kate Burke, I'm an emergency physician, but I wanted to amplify and thank Josh, Dr. Josh, along uh, with the technologists in the room and the entrepreneurs that are really working on uh, bringing voice into the clinical space. Um, in my practice, we have 24 emergency physicians and 18 of them uh, use voice, use human voice in the forms of scribes, just as you mentioned. We've had them for approximately seven years. And what we've witnessed is uh, increased job satisfaction, uh, increased longevity in uh, the practice of a um, specialty that has actually the highest level of burnout across all specialties in American uh, medicine. Uh, and we've also uh, witnessed an increase in productivity. So I think if we can move the human voice scribe into uh, an AI type uh, Alexa in the workplace, that would uh, obviously be a big cost savings. Uh, but the difference for patients who absolutely love having clinicians sitting down and looking at them in the eye versus working on their PC in uh, no pajama time uh, has been really transformational. Thank you very much for those great questions. Um, any closing remarks from the panel? No. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to learn from you.